This is World to Win, bringing you the latest news and analysis from a socialist perspective. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of World to Win. I want to say hello to my co-host first. How are you doing, Dara? I'm not bad, Yara. How are you? Um, it was just uh, me alone last week, uh, but glad to have you back now. Yeah, I saw, but you did a great job and it was, you know, uh, kind of... Uh, Really good to see uh, you getting used to your new position as uh, uh, another co-host, so that's uh, great. And speaking of the last episode, I think it was a really good episode about kind of the, the growing far right. And it really connects to what we're going to talk about today, you know, uh, where obviously the last episode was recorded kind of like in the wake of uh, Roe v. Wade, kind of the leaked uh, uh, kind of decision from the Supreme Court to uh, take back uh, that decision. And now I think it's really important for us to discuss it uh, fully uh, uh, today. So, you know, I think it's, it's a real indictment of capitalism to see how every single kind of uh, concession that we get from the state, even when it was 50 years ago, uh, can, be taken, can be taken back. Um, and today we're going to have a two part episode. One part is going to be about the situation in the US right now, obviously. The, the, this uh, leaked information didn't go, uh, you know, quietly. Uh, there's been a lot of protests and I think a lot of people are also looking up to see what we can do to defeat this. Uh, and I think it's really important that we discuss a way forward as well. So we're going to have a first part uh, discussing the situation in the US right now, what the movement is like and also what we can do and what strategy do we need to defeat this. But then we're also going to have a second part that's going to have this kind of more interna international contextualization of, uh, uh, of what's happening, just so that we you know, can look at other victories around the, uh, around the world and see yeah, what we can learn from them. So I want to introduce our speakers. First of all, we've got Keely from uh, Socialist Alternative in the US. How are you doing, Keely? I'm very good, thank you. What have you been up to recently? Have you been doing anything interesting other than uh, the abortion pro protests? Um, yeah, I was spending a lot of time at an Amazon warehouse just before um, the leaked draft. I was looking forward to having a couple of days to relax after having spent, you know, two weeks straight out on Staten Island uh, at an Amazon facility and then the leaked, the leaked memo happened. And so no, no rest for the wicked, but but it's good. It's exciting times. Yeah, it, it seems like, you know, every time we have an episode of, of World to Win, we're discussing what, uh, what we're going to talk about. And every time it's, you know, something major just breaks out in the US. So, uh, I mean, the, the, on the one hand, it must be really, really, you know, uh, kind of, there's a lot to do, um, which is probably very tiring, but also really exciting to see uh, the movements kind of growing. And, uh, and you know, I think I'm, I'm I'm always looking uh, to what your section is doing uh, to get a bit excited. And speaking of your section, we also have Noelle here uh, from Socialist Alternative in the US. How are you doing, Noelle? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. So have you been doing anything? Uh, I'm sure that you're really busy with the uh, Roe v. Wade protests, but what, what have you been up to other than that? Yeah, that has been most of what we're doing here. We really... Um went sort of full tilt into the protests for the right to abortion. So been going to like the Planned Parenthood Day of Action, but also having action conferences about how to organize a response to it. And that's been most of what I've been doing. Yeah, I can imagine it's pretty full on. Um, and speaking of that, I'm sure that our third guest also has a lot of memories from only, uh, you know, participating in these uh, type of activities. We've got Laura here from uh, Rosa International in Ireland, who is also a member of our section in Ireland, the Socialist Party. So how are you doing, Laura? Hi, Yara. Um, and hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm good. Um, just I'll give you a quick up update on a relevant political development in Ireland, which is basically today the government just signed off on building a new um national maternity hospital that they're going to they've gifted to the nuns it's public money going in to build this hospital that's going to be the hospital for you know a huge amount of uh, the pregnant people women 
um, in the state for years and decades to come. And it's been, hand, you know, the, the nuns and the religious right are still going to have an uh, important say in the board and how that's run. So even in a country where we won a massive victory, and I'll just say on abortion only a few years ago, and the politicians, the, the very politicians who stood up and tried to claim that they were part of it in the end, the ones that were anti-choice only a few years before, have now done this massive betrayal. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a very relevant point about the, the system, even when we fight and we win huge rights, they'll still take them back um, any chance they get, you know. Yeah, it's actually horrendous to, to hear this because, you know, we're all looking up to uh, Ireland and what's happened there with abortion rights. But it's really important to remember that like Roe and like the victories everywhere else, uh, we are always kind of like, um, you know, the, the, these, these successes could always be taken back. Um, so I wanted to ask the first question. I wanted to ask uh, uh, Noel the first question. So can you explain exactly what's at stake here? I mean, what, what would actually be the impact of Roe being overturned? Yeah, so there are what's called trigger laws in 13 states in the US, which would basically take effect immediately after Roe is overturned and ban abortion in those states. And there are also plenty of other states in the US with Republican, with Republican state legislatures that would also use this chance to likely ban abortion for it fairly quickly after Roe v. Wade would be overturned. So, and many of these laws are fashioned like Texas's abortion ban to penalize traveling to get an abortion, to penalize providing people with abortion in states where it is legal, where it would remain legal, and to criminalize, for example, like the abortion pill. So this would basically destabilize abortion infrastructure in the entire United States, even in states that at the moment have protections, for example, on the right to abortion. Many people like already had to take time off work, pay to travel, and then also pay for abortion care. So if Roe is overturned, people would have to travel farther. They'd have to pay more in some cases. It's completely unacceptable. And that's why we need like massively expanded access to abortions. And instead we got this threat to Roe v. Wade. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you actually dig into some of the specifics of these trigger bans, it's just, I mean, what it shows is it's its a sheer hatred for for women and LGBTQ people, anyone who's capable of getting pregnant. In, in uh, North Dakota, they are trying to make abortion a felony uh, at any point. Um, at any point during pregnancy, regardless of, of whether the woman or pregnant person's life is in danger. In Oklahoma, it's styled, um, like Noel was saying, similar to the Texas ban, where anyone who aids and abets an abortion um, can, be, can be sued. Uh, in Arkansas, anyone who performs an abortion or attempts to form an abortion, uh, to perform an abortion, uh, can be faced with a 10-year prison sentence. I mean, this is just the level of barbarism uh, and going after not just the individuals who are uh, seeking care, but also any working person who is providing that care uh, is also on the chopping block. Yeah, I think it, it it looks like, you know, so ominous and so horrendous at the same time. And after 50 years of this threat, you know, always being hung over the heads of uh, women and people who can get pregnant in the U.S., it's really frightening to see what was happening and like, you know, how many states are going to, you know, now use this, use this as an opportunity to attack the rights of people uh, 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 when they want to have abortion. But also like this is coming in the context of generally the far right. Like we talked about this in the uh, last episode in the context of France, but the, we've also had a previous episode very recently about the don't say gay bill. Uh, in the U.S. as well. So, what what is this context uh, that that this uh, this um, decision is made uh, in, and like what what does it mean? Does it mean that the far right is you know going stronger and stronger? Yeah, I mean the the uh, full scale of the attacks on on all sorts of oppressed people in the U.S. right now is really. I mean, it's quite horrific with uh, there's the don't say gay bill, but there's also just brutal attacks on young people's access to gender affirming care, 
Um, and that's sort of the new pet project of the right is particularly going after uh, gender inclusive health care. Um, and so hormone treatments, you know, any sort of a, a wide variety uh, of attacks in a number of states. And I think what's sort of confounding for a lot of people is that this is happening in the context of, you know, full Democratic control in Washington, the Democrats in the White House, in uh, both chambers of Congress. Uh, and, you know, they were elected on a whole series of promises. I mean, Biden said verbatim that he promised to codify Roe, to write Roe v. Wade into law to protect it from uh, attacks from a reactionary Supreme Court. And, you know, they've obviously entirely failed to do that. And it's it's a lack of it's a lack of political will. I mean, there's they will they'll cower and say that there's all these obstacles to getting it done, but it's their job to get it done. We elected them to get it done. And so it's on them to figure out how to overcome those obstacles uh, rather than, you know, hide behind them. And I think it's exactly this democratic, this incompetence from the Democratic Party that's given the space to the right wing uh, to, to grow in this way. And it's not that um, it's not that these policies are popular. They're enormously unpopular. Uh, the vast majority of, of ordinary people in the U.S. have no appetite for for the, the viciousness of these attacks. But the right is using them to whip up their base. They have nothing to say to ordinary people to bring down prices. They can't deal with inflation. And so the way that they are sort of, you know, activating their most hardened supporters is on these like culture war issues, uh, which don't have broad appeal, but but are allowing them to sort of win elections, particularly at the local um, and state level. But I would just say, I mean, I think the right um, has dug a hole for itself a bit, um, not a bit, a pretty serious hole for itself, because while these these attacks can, you know, bring sh some short term gains uh, electorally, there's going to be an overreach, at which point they actually trigger a massive reaction um, against these against these policies, against these attacks. And we're seeing the beginnings of that now, but it's going to be much more explosive uh, in the coming years. Yeah, thanks very much, Keely. I think certainly from the reports and videos of the protests, which have been eagerly following what you say about overreach and just provoking that response definitely seems to be true because there does seem to be an incredibly militant and angry mood and a real willingness to fight, although even if in its early stages, I think significant. And I think that can be connected to an increased rejection of sexism um, in all its forms amongst young people in the US, particularly with the whole Me Too phenomenon. I mean, the immediate marches that were called in response to Trump being elected, the women's marches, and also the, you know, cancel Kavanaugh protest, which Keely, I had the, the pleasure to be in Boston during that with yourself and, and helping organize those, those protests. And when I look at what's happening today, I see elements of that type of mood. But I have to say, it does seem to be on a much higher political level because it's come in a different context. I mean, when I say aftermath of COVID, I, I don't mean it's finished, but, you know, um, after you know the, the pandemic, after BLM, but also under a Biden presidency. So I think I'd love to ask Noel if they could give us a sense of the character of the movement at this time, bearing all that in mind, and also maybe go into a bit of the, the role that socialist alternatives are playing in, in building that movement. Yeah, so many people that I've been talking to at protests ha like really want to fight for the right to abortion and want to know how to do that. So it's a bit frustrating because Democrats' response to this was basically like telling people to vote for pro-choice Democrats, which, as Keeley mentioned, we were under the impression that all Democrats were supposed to be pro-choice Democrats and they were supposed to fight for the right to abortion. And also, like, voting's going to come in November, so that's going to be too late. Like, Roe is projected to be overturned by then. So if we don't put up a fight. And so people at the protests that I've been at really feel like they're a bit let down, but they also feel like they need to fight really urgently. Um, so Socialist Alternative has been has been raising the demand for safe, legal, but also emphasizing free abortion uh, with Medicare for All that covers abortion care, reproductive care, and gender affirming care, which would expand access and infrastructure for abortion care massively in the United States. People at protests have been very like receptive to this demand like people walk up and they want to buy our signs especially the ones they're like i want this one this is free access to abortion because people are very aware that like the reality in the u.s for access to abortion has been that, like many people couldn't because it was prohibitive to pay for it and people were tired of that they've also been responding well to like abortion care is linked to 
things like people being able to afford to live. So public housing, um, funding for public schools for for kids and families and all of that kind of expansive, like offensive demands. Um, so this goes to show how many people like not only don't want Roe overturned, but how popular expanding access to abortion is, like Keeley mentioned. There have been organized student walkouts and a walkout of healthcare workers at Tufts Medical Center that Socialist Alternative um, has been working with these like students and these workers to organize. Um, these actions that escalate the movement are what Socialist Alternative chapters across the country are trying to build and are building action conferences to organize. This is the kind of action that is necessary to actually win this fight and to defend Roe and further to ensure that everyone has access to free, safe, legal abortion. Thanks, Noelle. Uh, Keely, I don't know if you wanted to come in on any of that as well. Yeah, there's just yeah one one component that I'd add is that we um, sort of recognizing this just this deep well of anger against the Democratic Party. We have uh, initiated a petition uh, called no more excuse no more excuses which essentially calls on um you know people it's people pledging not to vote for democratic party politicians in the midterms after they they fail to go all out to defend roe v wade and write it into law this has just been an enormously popular thing among especially young people uh, at the demonstration in seattle the other day there were 675 people that signed this petition uh on paper saying you know we're not going to buy into this logic that voting blue is the solution to protecting our rights year after year when that's all they have on offer and then they don't do it. Um, but crucially, we don't just leave it at, oh, well, abstentionism, we're not going to support the Democratic Party. It's connected then to saying, I pledge to participate in building a left alternative, um, which is the clear thing that's needed, a new political party for working people. And so this has been a, a really galvanizing part of our of our broad um, approach. Yeah, and I think, you know, what you're saying now about building this movement is so important because there is this kind of, I guess, element uh, on maybe kind of like amongst liberals that Roe v. Wade as a whole is kind of a marker of how society is progressing uh, and, and becoming more progressive uh, generally with time and kind of pointing at the far right as something that's going against the natural order of things uh, where all of us are progressing towards uh, being more left or more open or more socially accepting or whatever it is. Um, and I think also a, a huge element of that also comes from this belief that the institutions like the Supreme Court or like the legal system generally or governments or just, you know, the establishment are kind of more progressive than the people or they're the, 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 the things that are going to make society more progressive. And I think that misses a lot of the point because it's not just the Supreme Court, you know, now with the Trump nominations and now it's super far right and now it's horrible. It's also that the, you know, in the context of 50 years ago, when Roe v. Wade was made a decision, uh, it wasn't just because it wasn't because the, the judges are super progressive and wanted to give um, uh, to give abortion rights. So, Noel, can you tell us a little bit about um, how Roe v. Wade actually was won in the first place? Uh, was it just the Supreme Court? Uh, well, no, absolutely not. Like, the Supreme Court that Roe v. Wade was won under was also a conservative Supreme Court and a conservative president was won under Nixon. And I think the fact that we're here again, 50 years after Roe v. Wade was won in the first place, um, and fighting to defend it and the right to abortion is pretty good proof that society does not just sort of, like, naturally become more progressive through these institutions and like the Supreme Court becomes more and more progressive. Like one Supreme Court passed Roe v. Wade and one is trying to overturn it 50 years later. Um, the way that Roe was won, you know, is further proof. So Roe was handed down under, like I mentioned, a majority uh, conservative Supreme Court. So it didn't sort of pass by their like good political will that they were like, oh, here you can have this right that nobody was asking for but you know we're really good so we'll give it to you it was actually won under the context of a huge well-organized feminist movement um and in addition the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s and the anti-vietnam war movement that were causing huge social unrest to um and demanded concessions from 
the court and from um, the sort of political establishment. And that really is the only way that rights like this are won is under like huge organized movements that demand these rights. One of the tactics, um, for example, that was used in the 60s and 70s was uh, when abortion was largely banned, there were women's groups like the Jane Collective, which refused to sort of like hold that ban um, that would find ways to provide people. They'd, they'd post signs that were like, are you pregnant? Do you not want to be? Um, and like, instead of sort of doing this under like a, a sort of closed, like keeping it hidden and unsafe, they made a commitment to like, this is going to be civil disobedience. We're going to do this in the open. And if you don't like concede our right to abortion, we are going to take it anyway. Um, and at a time when we have the safest abortion care, the the safest reproductive care we've ever had, like we should not be losing access to this legally or sort of in in um, people's ability to afford it. So like I think that that's part of our fight too is like everyone deserves the legal, safe, free abortion care that they need. Yeah, I think um, just on that, I mean it is shows you how there's a still a i mean this was even a feature in ireland um immediately after laura touched on this in her introduction that um immediately after repeal was won there was a, a battle for for the narrative and the ideas as well and i think that's definitely a feature that um a lot of young people when they do find out this story the history of roe v wade and the context it was won in the, the militant tactics etc um, it is quite eye opening, and I think it's no coincidence that the Democrats um, and the liberal establishment don't put forward that idea as well, because uh, it would be a threat to their type of politics today. So, with that in mind, then uh, Keely, what do you think some of the key lessons from that movement were? Uh, how do you think they can be applied today in bringing the movement forward with the correct program, strategy, uh, and methods to winning a victory on this? I mean, what the moment right now just cries out for, which, you know, existed when Roe v. Wade was won, was mass women's organizations that had, uh, you know, the capacity to, to more or less democratically determine uh, the sort of approach and tactics of, of the movement. And that's what's missing uh, today, which is so critically needed is, um, you know, we can't rely on, unfortunately, the liberal, you know, women's rights NGOs, which are playing a very de demobilizing and demoralizing role, uh, the need for structures for the movement uh, that are p participatory, and crucially, the need for demands, you know, demands and a program. This is something that the uh, liberal NGOs have shied away from. They've said, you know, the specific things like we don't even want to talk about choice. Um, to talk about choice is a mistake. We want to talk about decisions. Um, as if like, uh, creative slogans is sort of um, creative and weak slogans is the solution uh, to winning this. And so I think what what, um, you know, a socialist feminist approach, a working class approach means putting forward a program for, you know, what does it mean to choose to be a parent in either direction, whether you do or don't want children? Uh, universal free child care, um, you know, uh, Medicare for all, like Noel um, brilliantly said earlier, that includes a whole host of things, including um, supports for people who are having trouble getting pregnant but want to, which is an enormously expensive thing in the United States that should be uh, provided by a Medicare for all system, fully funded public schools. Uh, and then crucially, I mean, I think that the baby formula shortage right now in the U.S. is uh, demonstrating a um, the massive uh, gap in terms of the ability of capitalism to meet the needs of working parents, where there's a life and death struggle for nutrients for, for just born babies. And uh, Pete Buttigieg, who's the Secretary of Transportation, just was interviewed a couple days ago and said, um, while we live in a capitalist country, the government doesn't make baby formula, nor should we. And to me, that's a huge indictment of the fact that the market actually can't meet the demands of working parents if we had uh, you know, some semblance of, of an organized plan to the economy where we could determine what's needed at any given moment. Parenting becomes something that's so much, so much easier for, uh, for people who, who do want children and also the complete freedom to decide that you don't want children. 
Yeah, I think it's actually, you know, th these comments that are being made are, are really disgusting. It's like we live in a capitalist country, so the government shouldn't make baby formula, even though there's such a shortage that we're seeing these horrific photos of babies that are lacking it. And then we're also hearing about, uh, you know, these kind of people buying loads of baby formula and selling it at ridiculous prices. Uh, not to mention that baby formula is already way too expensive, even when there's no shortage. But on the other hand, we live in a capitalist country so we can force you to have the baby that you don't want and then afterwards, you know, you do whatever you need to do uh, to and, and let, let it starve. It, it, it's just, it makes no sense and it really, like you said, Keely, kind of shows those contradictions in the system of, on the one hand, we need to control your bodies, we need to control reproduction, but on the other, we can't actually sustain the majority of people's lives in not just a dignified way, but at all their lives in the first place. And I think that, you know, it's really easy to point at the US and say that it's, you know, a specific issue of Trumpism or a specific issue of the particular kind of like a super extreme, like liberal, like a, like a economic liberalism or neoliberalism. Uh, in the US, but we're seeing abortion rights being attacked over and over and over again across the world We're seeing in China that happening as well in Poland. We've just seen uh, in the, the, during the pandemic these uh, cynical attempts by the government to uh, To cut across the victories uh, that were won before uh, But then on the, on the other hand we are seeing uh, victories of movements of, of mass movements for abortion for bodily autonomy uh, in many countries, like in Ireland in 2018, but we've also uh, seen it in, in, in a number of other countries as well. So I think that, that overall, when we're talking about the issue of abortion under capitalism, we're seeing this kind of contradiction of the system that's on the one hand trying to block it, but on the other uh, uh, isn't really capable of dealing with the mass anger that's created from the ground across the globe. Yeah, yeah, these uh, processes that you're describing here, definitely something we also see across Latin America, where a series of right wing governments are carrying out attacks on abortion rights recently, uh, quite twisted irony or unconsciously doing it on International Women's Day. There was an attempt in Guatemala to bring in legislation that would increase jail time for women uh, seeking access to abortions for up to 10 years. And that's already in a country that some refer to as the pro-life capital of Central America. In Ecuador, the right-wing Guillermo Lasso seeking to roll back quite limited abortion rights. Of course, in Brazil, Bolsonaro backed by, you know, right-wing evangelical base, further curtailing already extremely limited abortion rights. All, of course, as part of a generalized assault on women and the oppressed. And then a whole raft of right-wing candidates from CAST in Chile, Millier in Argentina, Fujimori in Peru, all made opposition to abortion rights central planks of their election campaigns and part of their broader reactionary agenda. But I think what's really important to understand is that these come in the context of extremely positive developments and actually a response, a reaction, a retaliation to a militant mass feminist movement that has swept the continent uh, and throughout the region of Latin America over the last decade. And we've discussed before how a feature, defining feature, I'd say, of global feminist movement is its profound internationalist dimension. Um, and I think those that are on the streets in the US, although dealing with quite a grim uh, immediate scenario and prospect, are looking and taking inspiration from other struggles that are taking a place across the globe. And of course, a, a region that's been central for some of these victories has been Latin America. So, Keely, what do you think, um, as someone who's I'm sure paying attention to these developments, but also part of the movement at the moment in the US. What do you think are some of the key lessons to be drawn and applied to the movement in the US? Well, it's interesting because actually at the, the two sort of big demonstrations that we've participated in in New York, um, there's been a, a call you know, ahead of time for everyone to wear green. Um, and this is an homage to uh, the green wave, to the, the struggles of women in Latin America, which I think does demonstrate uh, a, a a pretty tremendous degree of international solidarity. Um, and I mean, you know, basically spurred on by, uh, by these feminist movements over years, 
um, like you said, we're seeing a, a, the right to abortion um, moving forward and the right to just general reproductive care moving forward uh, in a number of Latin American countries. Uh, while, you know, in the U.S. and China, the two pillars of sort of imperialism, we're seeing uh, abortion rights rolled back. Um, there was this, this, this special international impact of uh, the Maria Verde movement in Argentina, uh, where over a number of years there were protests um, and strikes and the you know reactionary establishment was defeated out of that. And then uh, in the last few years, abortion rights have been won in Argentina, uh, in Mexico, and in Colombia, um, and in, in Chile, where abortion was decriminalized in 2021. There's now this mass pressure uh, coming from a, a you know broad feminist uprising to include the right to abortion in this new constitution uh, that's being debated following the the rebellion in 2019. Uh, which saw working class women play a really key role. And I mean, the the importance of a working class socialist feminist program is that it's not actually just about defeating reaction. It's not just about going after the right wing, but also in opposition to sort of weak left reformist leaders uh, who are refusing to to put a real fight forward, like Pedro Castillo in Peru and also uh, Gustavo Petro in Colombia, um, who are behind the behind the curve. Um, of the mass movements in the region. Yeah, thanks, Keely. Um, I think some of these victories were particularly significant in Latin America, given the deep historical connection between church and state and the separation of which has been a key demand of the movement in fighting for secular health care, sexual education. And I think it, it is significant because, you know, that's not coincidental, but it's rooted in the fact that capitalism throughout the region has been so dependent, underdeveloped and weak that the institution of the church has been an essential ideological and institutional tool in maintaining social control in what's otherwise extremely unstable, extremely unequal societies. And I think for that reason, uh, there are many parallels with Ireland, where the church and state have similarly been historically uh, completely interwoven and um, anyone who thinks that those days have been left behind I think as Laura pointed to with the uh, recent events with the maternity hospital I think it clearly it is, is not the case but in Ireland I think that was also one reason why the 2018 victory uh, for abortion rights in the referendum was was similarly significant one of the many reasons why it was very significant where not only was it a removal, removal of the draconian ban on abortion from the constitution but also the winning of free abortion on a request up to 12 weeks. Uh, and I think, thankfully, great, I was able to play my own small role in that and be, be on, this, on the ground during that through uh, uh, Rose's campaign, Socialist Feminist campaign. And I think the mood in society, obviously, uh, been specifically about abortion rights, but as, as many people pointed out, I think it posed broader questions about the nature of Irish, Irish society, the nature of Irish capitalism, about sexism, about the, the state in general. So, Laura... Um, it would be great if you could kind of go into how that was won um, uh, and, yeah, the type of movement that was built and maybe some of the, the roles that we played in that. Yeah, I'd uh, be delighted to, Dara. Thanks for asking uh, me. Um, so maybe the first thing to say, because if there are especially American listeners here, uh, they might be really interested to know that um, the fight in Ireland was against a, a constitutional ban. So basically, it was in the constitution since 1983 that the woman is equate equal to a fetus. So it was actually in our constitution. And the, the, the way that came about is the anti-choice movement um, had great fear after Roe versus Wade because it went around the right of privacy and they 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 sort of campaigned and pushed that the establishment will give them this referendum to, to bring that in as a sort of block on any similar developments in Ireland. Um, and uh, of course, this caused horrendous, horrendous uh, difficulties for uh, for women, for people who can get pregnant. And um, uh, the, the, you know, the indignity of an abortion ban, the, 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 the indignity of that basic right not being there of controlling your own body. And then we know, you know, working class and poor women, especially affected and migrant women of colour, especially affected. But they had an Irish solution to an Irish problem whereby people got flights to England to get their abortions there at great cost and great shame, great difficulty. And abortion was not talked about for many years in Irish society. 
And then things changed with the um, absolutely tragic death of Savita Halapanavar in 20, October 2012. So it will be at the 10 year anniversary of the death of Savita later on this year. Um, a 31 year old um, a dentist from, from India originally um, come into hospital, 17 weeks pregnant, a wanted pregnancy, but have an inevitable miscarriage and was in agony begging for an abortion while septicemia took hold of her body and Savita died a number of days later. Um, after being denied her request for an abortion repeatedly and after being told in the public hospital in Galway, uh, the city where she lived, um, that this is a Catholic country as the explanation why she couldn't get uh, healthcare and life-saving healthcare as it turned out. And that sort of, that was a game changer at that moment, because actually even ever since 1983, it, it didn't actually represent the direction of travel of working class people's attitudes and where they were going much more progressive and actually away from that conservatism. Um, but it was, it, and there was important struggles in the 1990s, um, uh, including uh, one that wants, you know, a tiny change in the law, but minuscule. Um, and uh, but this was this this really significant watershed moment and um, uh, explosion of of anger and um, sadness and um, deep rooted desire for change on the streets and kicked off a chain of events that led to this victory in 2018. But just to say, literally up to 2018, Ireland had one of the most restrictive abortion uh, regimes in the world. And the whole political establishment was united around um, uh, this position. And even the parties that would like to be more liberal and are, you know, uh, all the rest, they, they were complicit in this uh, situation. So the key thing to say, what was the key lesson? That the struggle, a struggle and a movement, um, a tenacious struggle and a movement can achieve a uh, huge change. And... Uh, Nothing, you know, power concedes nothing without a demand. Actually calling for free and safe and legal abortion on request was extremely important. If the movement hadn't done that, we would never have won what we won. At the very start after Savita's death, some mistakes were made in the movement whereby there was a, like a focus on bringing in legislation to save life, to save life um, based on this case uh, from the 90s that I mentioned. And um, basically then 2014, the government did bring in a law a Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act, that's it. 14 years in prison if, if an abortion was carried out, apart from when your life is in immediate danger. And like generally, like nobody got abortions under that law subsequently. That year, uh, sorry, Miss Y, um, a, a pregnant uh, migrant woman, a child uh, uh, was denied an abortion, was force fed, um, uh, force fed because she was refusing food. Uh, that same year, another uh, young mother, um, tragically in an accident, was technically brain dead and was being kept alive against her family's wishes because she was pregnant. This was the this was the horror, you know. And um, I would say that the le the 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 role that the Socialist Party played. I mean, we set up um, Rosa Socialist Feminist Movement in the period after Savita died because we wanted. We said this is an historic opportunity to make a, a, a huge, huge victory for women and for um, progress for everyone who can get pregnant. We have to build that struggle and we wanted you know Keely talked about the need for a mass feminist movement but with it and we wanted to help to build that but also to simply build the socialist feminist struggle and wing within that movement um and just to you know there were many twists and turns Dara many many you know uh, there, there you know in terms of what we did what Rosa did and what the party did the you need to write a book. We we need to write a book to show everything we did, but we we pushed at all times. But also, um, a bigger and bigger movement was being built, led by young people, led by young women in particular, and um, but having deep support in the the urban working class most of all, the 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 section of society that suffered most at the hands of the church state link, you know, um, 
And um, specifically then, at a certain point in the movement, it was obvious that the government was going to have to grant the right to a referendum this way to get rid of the, the ban in the constitution. And in Rosa and the Socialist Party, we were extremely clear. Ruth Coppinger was in the doll in the parliament at the time. And, and we used that um, to build struggle on the streets, but also to raise the specifics of what was needed in the movement to actually win bodily autonomy, to actually push to win real, real abortion rights. And um, uh, the, the, this, the, the, one of the things that we did was when it was clear the referendum was going to come in, we said, they, they, they'll, OK, they'll grant us this because they have to, because they cannot deny the movement anymore and its deep support in society and its huge activism, including a strike for repeal called on 2017 by young people that had like huge participation in an informal way, etc. Um, and also, um, uh, we said, so we have to force that they'll actually bring in a law after the referendum that's pro-choice. Um, and we did on that basis, you know, I'll just finish with this uh, explanation of something that we did there, if that's okay. And I'll point back to something Noel said earlier, because Noel actually referenced that Jane in Chicago as part of, you know, second wave feminist fight in, in the States. And they were one of our inspiration for this um, these actions that we did. So, it, it, that was the time then um, into the 2010s that the abortion pill was becoming a more normal way to get an abortion. Obviously, it means it's a medical abortion, very easy, um, early abortion with pills, extremely safe, World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. And um, unlike Jane, who had to train themselves uh, to carry out surgical abortions like a complicated procedure, you know, we, you could literally have your own abortion safely with access to these pills with very minimal medical assistance and um, uh, once there's no contraindications. And so the, the, we worked with Women on Web um, to uh, make the pills part of the struggle, to bring them out uh, in civil disobedience actions, including an abortion pill bus where we went all around the country um, uh, saying, we do not care. You can try and limit our rights, but no matter what law you bring in, we're going to get abortions on our soil safely with these pills. So you have to bring in this law. And it was a huge point of pressure. And, um, uh, you know, even many, many voices in the in the establishment admit that the pills were a game changer. And the reason why they brought in 12 weeks on request, actually, because it's even linked to the time up to the time you can use the pill. So, it, you know, we did everything we could to further the fight um, in every single regard to build the struggle, to have no illusions whatsoever. That establishment won't deliver us anything unless we push for it, fight for it and then also be part of, of trying to any tactical thing we could do to show, to push, to push, push, push and, and win that right. So yeah, that's a summary of it, Dara. Thank you so much, Laura. I think this is, you know, the, the, the victory in Ireland is something that we always reference back to because of, like you said, it was so kind of draconian before and um, the, the, the victory is incredible, not just on the, you know, 12 weeks on request, which is amazing, but also the fact that it's free. Uh, which I think, again, the, you described really well the pressure uh, that was put from the ground. And I remember, and I'm sure Keely remembers as well, because I think Keely was also in Ireland during uh, around that time. I remember uh, uh, coming to a few uh, uh, to a few stalls on the street and a few meetings and, you know, protests. And I, I came from, you know, uh, it was before I moved to England. I came from Israel, Palestine. Well, obviously, the religious element is a lot less strong. It's more kind of like the state element in the way the abortions uh, uh, go. And I remember, on the one hand, seeing these visceral reactions that uh, some people had to these questions, but also this kind of overall support for the idea of abortion, like you said. And I think that there's uh, a real kind of need to trust in the working class and trust that the people, like you said, Laura, that, that, that the people who are suffering the most from these bans are the people who are going to fight the hardest against these bans, even if there's this massive propaganda about how, you know, the majority of working class people are so reactionary and they uh, don't want it and they're so religious and all of that, which is clearly not true from the case in Ireland, but also it's clearly not true in the US from the movements that we're seeing. So I, I want to ask you, Keely, because now that there's this kind of catalyst for anger and obviously there's also uh, the danger of demoralization based on this decision, uh, we kind of need to talk about the way forward. How do we win? And 
because there has been so many protests and so many, uh, you know, walkouts, uh, some of which were organized by our organization as well. Uh, it's really important to kind of take a look at different approaches to winning these victories. So can you tell us a little bit about what is our approach? What is the socialist feminist approach and how it's different to the other strategies and the other tactics that we're seeing in the struggle? Absolutely. I mean, I can tell you a brief story to illustrate this a bit. So in New York, um, just last Saturday, you know, Planned Parenthood organized these uh, these demonstrations, um, uh, the bans off our bodies demonstrations, which they, they sort of called under pressure from the demonstrations that that erupted onto the street uh, that Socialist Alternative called in the wake of the um, of the leaked dra- uh, Alito draft. And um, at the demonstration in New York, they sort of had, you know, everybody met in Brooklyn. Um, there was no rally. There were no speakers, nothing. It was just for people met in Brooklyn. They led a march. Um, I mean, this is 20,000 people. They led a march across the Brooklyn Bridge uh, where everyone then sort of um, met up at Foley Square, which uh, is a very important sort of center of, of protest in New York City. And when people arrived at Foley Square, they were blasting. And I mean, like blasting EDM music um, to basically make it impossible for people to have discussions, uh, conversations with one another. Uh, It was essentially, you know, driving people off the streets after this really energizing march uh, where then you're sort of waiting for, okay, what are the next steps? What are we going to do? And this, you know, went on for for a very long time. And by the time the, they, they did do a speaker's program, the crowd had dwindled to, you know, several thousand. Um, and so, so that's one approach to building the movement. A uh, socialist feminist approach to building the movement in contrast, um, what, what we were building for at, uh, at the demonstrations across the country on last weekend was for action assemblies where people can come together and have a uh, real discussion and debate around what types of tactics and strategies are needed to carry the movement forward. Things like occupations, uh, you know, broad direct action, die in at the courts, um, taking uh, taking aim not just at the, the courts and the Republican establishment, but also the Democrats. Um, and I would, you know, encourage people to to uh, to go to our uh, social media page, our whatever maybe the links can be put in uh, for the U.S. section where there are some exciting things in the works, which we don't want to totally blow up the spot of all the uh, branches, but some very exciting uh, sort of direct action that's going to be happening over the course of the next two weeks, uh, which we, uh, you know, hope can demonstrate and we can bring in the widest possible layer of young people who are looking not just for uh, a dance party at Foley Square, but are actually looking for a concrete actionable uh, steps to carry the movement forward um, that includes you know all the programmatic points and the demands that we talked about earlier what it, what does choice really mean uh, and then fighting for that on the basis of a working class approach um, and a militant approach I want, I'd like to add that I think we're crystal clear on two things that are really important right one is we're crystal clear on who our enemies are we're crystal clear on the absolute brutality of the capitalist system and the incapability of it providing in any way, shape or form for the rights and needs of the majority of the world's population, of the exploited and oppressed of this world and how actually it has a vested interest in maintaining and reproducing um, uh, the sexism and misogyny that, that flows into it and is inextricable in it. And therefore, you know, all of the the political establishment that maintains the status quo, the the mass media, the you know uh, big corporations, etc. All of them, we we will not find any friends in any element or section of the the broad capitalist establishment and class. And then where are our where can we um where are our allies? You know, it's it's absolutely the case that those, you know, most affected by abortion bans are going to be playing the key role in the struggle and fight against it. But but in doing so, we have a perspective and a, are fighting to build um, a solidarity and struggle um, across uh, many, many divides uh, to unite the exploited and oppressed of this world, actually of all genders, actually of all racial backgrounds and so on. And when we do that, we, we, we do it 
you know, with an uncompromising approach on, on bodily autonomy, on abortion rights. Um, and we do it also with raising the, 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 the need for that struggle to be broadly part of a socialist struggle. Look at the climate crisis. Look at the cost of living crisis. This is, there is no time to lose to actually, um, uh, you know, as we will get into the details of the tactics of how we um, further this fight in the way that Keely's talking about on abortion. But that is, is also, we're also using that to radicalize and build in a, a broad working class re revolt and organized socialist movement against this system. The, the, and that's absolutely necessary. And that is the movement that can unite. And that is the movement that will have, um, you know, uh, absolutely build. Because one of the things, if you like, lots of young people go and make the point about second wave feminism that um, uh, working class women were left behind, uh, black women were left behind and so on. And there's there's very important truths there because the, the you know, the reality of liberal feminism, yes, absolutely, that's true. Um, but we, we, you know, working class socialist feminism will build a fight that you can unite people and that really can um, uh, bring the oppressed masses on, onto the streets and struggle and, and for their own liberation. The, the, that that is that is actually the, and all of those things make you stronger in the fight you know it, it, just on if you link it back to Ireland and I'll finish on this it, it, you know we, I, I can honestly say like there were different moments in the struggle for example at a part, there was a very important referendum in 2016 on or 2015 on uh, marriage equality and we, one of the things that we did in Rosa was we raised the demand that there should be two, there should be two referendum on that, that referendum on that day, strike two blows against the Catholic Church, strike two blows for equality. And actually within the movement, I would say that lots of, by the way, people that I have respect for and have done lots of work and are very genuine campaigners on abortion over many years, but they were, they actually really didn't like that. They had a huge problem with us raising that because they didn't think you could win. Whereas we always knew we have to push, push, push. We, we're not going to convince the establishment and to force it through. And we actually know that if we, we know that we can win the referendum. We know that working class people are going to support us en masse in this movement for solidarity and equality and against the system. And um, yeah, so that's like a broad, like a point about, the theory of what we are and then what it actually means in a real struggle and how it actually aids our struggle. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you so much, Keely, as well. Like, I think that finishing on this is so important because, like we talked about, this is a brutal attack on our rights uh, and on the rights of women and people who can get pregnant in the US, but also internationally. Um, and uh, it's also not something that's just started today. So it's really important for us to finish on this point of like how we're going to fight it. And I think it's really inspiring for, to hear from you as well, Laura, to see that there is a way to fight it, even when the situation looks to a lot of people and a lot of, like you said, genuine campaigners as well, like it's doomed. It's not. And when we actually utilize the power of the working class and we organize on a mass level, we can actually be able to win, like to win a lot more than maybe a lot of people thought. And, you know, when we do get our liberation from oppression fully, then we can have these EDM parties. And I'm sure we'll all uh, uh, dance on that party uh, together. So thank you so much uh, for being here, both of you and also Noel. Uh, and see you soon. Wow, this was so good. And I, I always like these episodes because they make me kind of, you know, because we read about it all the time. And also we're seeing these amazing photos and videos from the walkouts and everything. But hearing kind of like the politics and the analysis of uh, kind of uh, our members and activists around the world where these things happen is always so inspiring. And also, you know, I, I like it when we talk about kind of how, how to win. It's always so important. And, you know, I think a lot of the time it can be so overwhelming. So it's really important that we talk about that. And obviously, especially in the context now that we're really, really close to Pride Month and I'm, I'm sure uh, everyone watching here is going to be involved in some sort of uh, pride events. Uh, so it's really important that we take this knowledge on and kind of push uh, for solidarity on Roe v. Wade uh, and abortion rights generally across the world. Uh, because obviously all of these things are connected. Gender oppression is connected uh, to uh, 
uh, uh, to Pride as well. And we should really uh, push for it and make it into a huge kind of part of our interventions around the world. But now let's move swiftly on to uh, the shout out of the week. So what are we shouting out uh, this week, Dara? Well, this week I feel is particularly important and I think relevant to the theme because uh, I think we've definitely had several shout outs in the past for socialist feminist activists in Russia who have been opposing the, the Putin regime um, also LGBTQ activists. Uh, and this week we want to stand in solidarity with Javid Memedov, who is a socialist and anti-war activist, a campaigner for women's and LGBTQ rights, a student trade union organizer who's facing prison for the third time for his opposition to the war and the Putin regime. And he'd just been released from prison after spending the previous month locked up only to be arrested again. So I think in in being offensive and in showing the movement and the people that are standing behind them, workers, ordinary people, trade unionists and socialists, um, ISA have held international protests on the 20th of May around the world in solidarity. And for those that are interested in, in showing solidarity to themselves, we're going to put a link in the description where we have posters for different languages, a model leaflet and resolution that can be used uh, to show support and solidarity in your trade union or in other movements and organisations that you're participating in. Um, so we'll leave that link there. You can read a bit, bit more about what's going on there and really urge everyone to um, stand in solidarity with Javid in this incredibly difficult time. Yeah, so please check the link out and donate if you can and read a little bit more. Uh, but for now, we are, uh, uh, are going to go and see you soon. This is World to Win. Every Sunday, we broadcast with speakers from across the globe, bringing you the latest news and analysis on the fast-moving global events from a socialist perspective. Subscribe to the International Socialist Alternatives YouTube page and click the bell to get notified when we go live for a new episode. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram because there's a lot to do and we have a world to win. When they fight! When they fight! When they fight! Solidarity!